uh, Professor Charles Spence from Oxford University, here to tell you about a few different kinds of unexpected connections uh, between pleasure and pain. To extremes of sensation that you might think don't have much to do with each other, but I want to convince you that by studying one, you can understand the other. Um, and why am I here telling you about that today? Well, I'm an experimental psychologist from Oxford University, interested in the senses of the consumer, the person at home, the person in the hospital, and how knowing about unexpected connections between our eyes, our ears, our nose and our mouth can be used in all walks of life to enhance the pleasure or perhaps even uh, to reduce the pain. I could tell you all day about the, the, the way the surprising connections between the senses that are currently being uncovered by psychologists and neuroscientists being the brain of the computer. You can see one person's brain scan flashing up there. Uh, but I'll just show you one video I think is the most powerful example of these surprising connections between the senses. So what I want you to do is to look at the face that you're about to see on the left of the screen and think about the sound that you hear going into your ears. I'm only asking you about what you hear. This is a demonstration of uh, the clip for man. Uh, and you should hear something like, bah. Uh, bah. Now look at the face on the right of the screen and think about what you hear going in your ears. Uh, uh, now you should hear something like, da or da instead. And now whenever you look to the left of the screen, you'll hear one thing. Bar. Whenever you look to the right of the screen, you'll hear something else. Da. So this is the well-known well -known McGurk effect, discovered by accident by psychologists back in the 1970s, but it shows very powerfully the connections, surprising connections, to scientists and layperson alike between what we see and what we hear. In this case, it's always the same sound that you're hearing again and again, but by changing what you see, the lip movements, I know how the connections work in your head, and I can change the sound that's going into your ears. Um, so that's the background. A scientist interested in the interesting, surprising connections in here between the senses. Um, but I'm here today to tell you about another kind of surprising connection between pleasure and pain. And the kind of story starts back in 1997 when I was, uh, opened my research lab in, in Oxford, the Crossmodal Research Lab. Um, and most of the funding for our lab has come from industry, the Unilevers and Procter and Gambles, people like that, whose business it is, at least at one level, to increase pleasure in their consumers by selling products that give more joy to the consumer, and hence people will buy more, come back again for, for, for a second helping. It could be tea bags, it could be uh, shampoo, as we see here. And the question is, how can you increase the pleasure of a product? Uh, and how can you do that by knowing about these connections, the surprising connections in your head? But when you look in the literature and say, OK, what, what do we know so far about pleasure and how to use the senses to increase that? It's something you can find nothing written about because pleasure is something that's kind of not sort of suitable for scientific study in, in, in some sense. But instead, if you go to the opposite extreme of pleasure, to pain, there you find a lot of literature about what factors, what influences can make things hurt more or hurt less. So already I have kind of a surprising connection here that I was sort of funded by a uh, big business to study pleasure in products, in foods and beverages, say, and to try and really understand that, I went to the opposite extreme, to pain, to try and see what factors uh, would affect, make things more painful or less, and then apply them back uh, to the product design setting. And you might think of pleasure and pain. How, how are those things related? Are they opposite extremes of emotional experience? One deeply joyful, one at the opposite extreme of very painful or unpleasant. Um, or are they different in kind? Some philosophers would say pain is, is just a sense. We have eyes to see, ears to hear, nose to smell. And maybe we have a sense of pain as well to tell us about bodily damage. Um, so maybe pain and pleasure are opposite extremes of the emotion scale, or maybe they are different kinds of things. Uh, maybe that's the kind of question that only a philosopher can answer. And what I want to share with you are some of the insights and the surprising connections that have appeared uh, in, in our lab when we've looked at pain in order to try and enhance pleasure. This is the kind of situation in a hospital in the north of England where we're studying a patient, participant, I should say, who's volunteered for five pounds to have uh, his or her left arm burnt with a pain laser. Um, it takes a certain sort, but uh, if you put the adverts out, people will come in. Um, <laughs> and what we'll do is we, we, we'll 
present painful stimuli, very carefully controlled, so painful so they hurt, but not so that they you know, cause any permanent damage. That was the idea. Uh, and then we'll see how releasing smells and changing tastes and colours can influence, make things more or less painful. The only problem was in this study, uh, my bit of kit that was designed to control this pain laser in the hospital one day jammed. And I had a colleague um, with her arm on the, uh, on the table with a pain laser burning away. Normally it comes on for like a hundredth of a second and it's off. A very sharp pinprick kind of pain. On this occasion, uh, the laser stayed on. It didn't switch off. And my friend just had her hand there. Slowly a hole was being burnt into her arm. But the power of expectation was so strong that she just sat there and it wasn't she who moved her hand away from the pain. It was the nurse who heard the machine wasn't clicking appropriately and kind of swept uh, the hand away. So what this first study of pain showed is just the incredible power of expectation, that things no longer hurt if you're expecting them to be temporary and not to last for long. And something very similar, the power of expectation is really right there at the heart of pleasure. And I'll focus for today on the pleasure of sort of food experiences. Um, Within a hundredth of a second of your brain seeing that picture of what looks like a nice scoop of ice cream, it might be strawberry, it might be raspberry, uh, it's almost lunchtime, maybe you'd like a scoop or two. Within a hundredth of a second, your brain has had expectations about what that is. Is it sweet or salty? Uh, it, what flavor will it have? How much energy will it have? Do I want it now or not? And those expectations determine in a large part the experience you would have if you were to have the opportunity to try that. But in this case too, the expectations are misleading because this dish comes from a modernist restaurant uh, from Heston Blumenthal's Kitchens in Bray. This is in fact a frozen savoury mousse. Very popular 100 years ago on British tables, not so today. And if you come to this dish with the expectation that it's going to be sweet and strawberry flavoured, when you put a spoonful in your mouth, you kind of spit it out and go, oh, it's horrible, it's salty, I don't like it. And if I say, okay, it's really a frozen savoury mousse and I give you some more two weeks later, you still will not like it because that initial expectation that was disconfirmed, you thought sweet, you got salty, will ruin the experience for you. So in both the case of pain and pleasure, expectations are playing a huge role. What I can do here as a psychologist to help the chef, um, one could say, if I tell you this is food 386, you have no idea what food 386 is, neither do I, but that's enough for you to kind of hold up your expectations and say, I quite what I'm going to get. And if that's the case, then when you taste this dish, you have it with open eyes, without expectations, and you'll enjoy uh, the results of Heston's cooking that much more. It will taste uh, good to you, and you will eat more a few weeks later. And expectations come in many shapes and forms. They can be led by colour, uh, by the man in the white coat who you think you could trust to, to, to um, burn your arm only occasionally and not in any dangerous way. Or it can come from price. And there too, pleasure and pain are unexpectedly connected. There are many sort of fun studies. Uh, we've done some in the world of wine. where you take experts in the world of wine or social drinkers, give them some wine and ask them to rate the quality, how much pleasure do they get from the experience and if you tell them that that wine cost $90 versus $5, exactly the same wine in both cases, both the expert and the social drinker will get far more pleasure from the experience the more they think you or somebody else paid for that bottle. We can even look inside the brain at the orbitofrontal cortex and see kind of the pleasure centers lighting up, lighting up more the more you think something cost. More pleasure uh, for uh, more money spent. At the opposite extreme, Pains are also modulated by the amount you pay. In this case, the amount you pay for a painkiller, a paracetamol, an aspirin. Uh, in that case, if I tell you this pain pill cost $5 rather than one, it will be significantly more effective in uh, alleviating the symptoms of your pain. So expectations in both cases is helping to enhance the pleasure of food and drink and to suppress the pain uh, of uh, unpleasant experiences. Um, another way in which pleasure and pain are connected is in terms of colour. If you ask a child or an adult alike to say, uh, think about pain and, and tell me what colour pain is. It's kind of a silly question because pain doesn't literally have a colour. And yet most people, when asked that question, will immediately respond, well, pain is red. Pain is probably sharp as well. Um, and maybe red is the colour of blood, so that links to bodily damage. Uh, we're not quite sure why this exists, but we know that most people will say pain is red. And that red colour is so powerful in the world of pain that as I have my pain laser moving it up and down your arm to give you these occasional jolts of pinprick pain, if the laser beam looks like it has a red colour, you will say it hurts you more than if I use a blue coloured beam instead. It's exactly the same. The laser you cannot actually see. This is just 
a beam to help me know where I am on your arm. But I change the colour from blue to red, and suddenly the pain you experience and you rate is significantly higher. So red is a very powerful colour in the world of pain. And red is also perhaps the most colourful, uh, powerful colour in the world of pleasure too. Um, if we're trying to give people more pleasure in a food or drink, making it sweeter perhaps, more energy, more calories, more, more sweetness, then red is really good. Uh, I can make a drink perhaps 10 or 11% sweeter for you without adding a single calorie simply by getting the appropriate rich dark red colour. And why does red work in the, in the, color of, in, in the world of flavour so well? Well, perhaps because we've all sort of learnt to internalise the fact that fruits in nature very often go from green and sour through red and ripe. And so that ch colour change from green to red uh, is co uh, correlated with a shift from sour taste to sweet taste, and hence red is really good. If I'm trying to make something taste more salty, uh, say, I've got a much harder job because foods in nature, salty foods, come in all colours. But red is perhaps the single best colour for changing our experience uh, of food, increasing the pleasantness of the sweetness, say, of an ice cream uh, or, or something else, a fruit juice. And those two things, kind of the expectation and the red effect, come together in this, one of my favourite experiments uh, from Moreau and colleagues in France, who took, in this case, um, students on a university uh, degree course on wine, onology, gave them a glass of white wine, asked them, sniff the wine, what do you, what do you experience? What, what, what aroma notes do you get? And they would say things like straw and citrus and lemon and lychee and maybe cat's piss if, they, if they've read Oz Clark's work. Um, give them a glass of red wine and if they're good students, what do you smell now? You'll smell tobacco and chocolate and, uh, and dark fruits. Maybe it's a stone fruit, perhaps a black currant or, or, or cherry, I'm not quite sure. Then give them a glass of the white wine again, but artificially coloured with that powerful red colour to set the expectations on what the wine students or the wine expert experience they experience the red, red wine aromas, the tobacco, the chocolate, even though what's before their nose is, in fact, just the white wine. Again, using the power of these unexpected connections between our eyes and our nose to influence even the expert to perceive things differently. So, so far, I've kind of tried to tell you about how, uh, in my own trajectory, there was a connection between pain and pleasure, and we used the study of pain in order to try and enhance the pleasure that we were delivering. Um, but I think things go also the other way, and that was kind of brought home to me. Um, this is my ex-supervisor, John Driver, uh, from Oxford and from Cambridge. And uh, he, he killed himself about a year and a half ago. Very successful scientist, and threw himself off a bridge on the M1 motorway leading up north uh, from London. Why did he do that? Well, six months before he killed himself, he'd been in an accident. His moped in the streets of London had been knocked over by a car, and he damaged his leg. And it was an excruciating pain, pain that would not be cured by pills, pain that was not uh, eliminated by two rounds of extreme surgery. And after six months, two surgeries, lots of pills, the pain was so bad, he ended it all. And that kind of brought home to me the importance of studying pain in its own right, regardless of whether it might help you to uh, enhance pleasure as well. And I think what many people like John have is when they have car accidents, say on a bike or a motorbike, or they may fracture a limb, say a wrist, Things might seem to be recovering pretty well in, in the immediate short term, but then a few months later, suddenly the pain comes back with a vengeance, and it just will not go away. Here you can see two examples of patients with this kind of chronic regional pain syndrome, CRPS, uh, with a left hand kind of uh, enlarged slightly on the left of the screen here. So this is a terrible condition. People cannot bear their hand to be touched. It's so painful, nothing will work. And we wondered whether knowing about those unexpected connections in here could help in some small way to alleviate the pain for these patients where surgery and pharmacology does not help. And our idea was to use um, minification, the idea that things that are bigger make more, and if you can make things smaller, perhaps that will reduce the pain. Uh, and so what we did, we took 10 of these patients with chronic regional pain syndrome, uh, got them to look at their hand through a magnifying glass so it looked bigger, or got them to look at their hand through a pair of binoculars, just turned backwards so their hand looked tiny and far away. And then they had to make some stereotypical judge movements with their affected limb as best they could. And what we found is that those patients uh, who looked at their hand through the minifying glass, so it made it very small, subjectively related their pain as significantly lower. And not only that, the amount of swelling in their hand went down as a result of this psychological illusion based on surprising connections in here. 
We can say this works in the short term. We're currently doing long-term follow-up studies in Australia to see how long this kind of psychological pain relief uh, will last. But this idea of shrinking or ex ex expanding the world that we see could also be used in, it, back in the world of pleasure. And I have colleagues in Japan who are using virtual reality, augmented reality. We have a display here with a guy who's got a, an Oreo cookie in his hand. Quite small, he'll give him a certain amount of pleasure. But if through his virtual reality headset, he can see a really big cookie, as shown on the screen, maybe there's that much more pleasure to be had. Maybe he'll be satisfied with less, and hence less likely to be obese, uh, and so on. So this is one use of technology at the moment, again, trying to modulate people's eating and uh, enhance the pleasure by making things look bigger uh, or smaller than they actually are. Again, the question will be how long such effects last and whether people are happy to wear these headsets uh, or not. Who knows? Um, next, one other kind of psychological illusion that we've used both in the world of pleasure and in the world of pain, again, based on these surprising connections, is the uh, rubber hand illusion. Here I am, a subject, with my hand behind a screen, with a joke shop rubber hand uh, directly in front of my view. Steve, the experimenter in blue, is stroking both of those hands in synchrony. So I see the rubber hand being stroked, but I feel my own hand being stroked out of sight. And within eight to 10 seconds of this, uh, the majority of people will suddenly get a very strange sensation. They start feeling as if their own hand is the rubber hand. Their hand starts feeling rubbery. If they have to use their other hand to point under the table to where their hand really is, they'll point to the rubber hand and not their own. So this is kind of an out-of-body experience. And psychologists are currently using this to say, if, we take, uh, if you embody a rubber hand, will you end up leaving any pain you have in your own hand behind, uh, behind the screen, as it were? So attempts to use this to, again, modulate pain through psychological trickery or the surprising connections in here. So this is um, sort of the, the, the rubber hand illusion being used to try and reduce pain. What about the world of pleasure? Ah, uh, here we go. This is a butcher's tongue. Uh, skinned on the left with skin on the right. I recommend you use the one on the right. You can all do this at home. Get a butcher's tongue, take it home, build yourself a little box, um, and get your friend to stick their tongue out, like so. Uh, and they get a little mirror so that they can see the butcher's tongue loitering a little bit ahead of them. They get two clean Q-tips and stroke your friend's tongue, and at the same time stroke the butcher's tongue. And again, within a few seconds, many people get a very strange sensation that their tongue is no longer in their mouth, but out there where the butcher's tongue is. And once you've got that, induce the illusion, you can ask about, does, does a pleasure of flavor taste less good out there than in here? Many people will say anecdotally, when they lick a lolly, it doesn't taste quite as good when the tongue is out of the mouth. Things in the mouth seem to be more intense, more pleasurable, um, Maybe they're less so here. And then if you're really devious, what you can do to your friend, <laughs> get the scissors out uh, and cut the, um, the butcher's tongue. Uh, my host wanted me to say, please don't necessarily try this at home. And, and no one was hurt in, in, in the process. But people get a very strong sensation, a very immediate sense. Ah! The heart rate will go up, the skin conductance will go up, and we've induced kind of virtual pain in the butcher's tongue. Uh, lots of fun to be had, very cheap and easy to do, all based on the connections that we have uh, in our head up here. So what I want to leave you with is that um, I think there are surprising connections between the world of pleasure and the world of pain. And in order to understand one, you can learn a lot by studying the other. But whatever you do, whatever product you make, whatever product you might be thinking of making, whether it be on the pleasurable or painful end of the spectrum, uh, whether you're trying to ramp up the pleasure or reduce the pain for whatever reason, uh, it's my firm belief that we'll get there faster by understanding the mind of the consumer or of the patient and of the surprising connections between the senses that reside in here. Thank you very much.